Hello. Today I'd like to have a little conversation about geopolitics and geoeconomics. Over the last couple of years, great power rivalries are intensifying. At the same time, uh, conflicts between old enemies are mounting and frozen conflicts are flaring up again. Geoeconomic shockwaves are hitting the world economy. It seems the old order is coming to an end, but we do not know yet what the future will look like. Still, countries, companies and communities have to make decisions with long-lasting effects. In this strategic uncertainty, all that we can do is speculate. So allow me to do so for a little while. Uh, what I see over the next one or two decades is basically four scenarios playing out. So the four scenarios that I see is basically, number one, a hot war. A hot war basically between the United States and China, most likely over Taiwan, which then spreads into a regional and potentially world war. Second scenario is a cold war. There will be proxy wars, but mostly the strategic competition will play out on the fields of economics and technology. So we will see bipolarity when it comes to military alliances, um, but we see also ideological binaries, democracy versus autocracy. We're going to see technological bifurcation or tech war, uh, and we see maybe the emergence of rival trade blocks, uh, or what you may call economic deglobalization and decoupling. Third scenario is a managed strategic competition, a peaceful co uh, coexistence based on a concert of great powers. It's more like an informal backroom kind of uh, governance, minilaterals uh, that we already see today. It is about the acceptance of red lines and exclusive spheres of influence and everyone else is hedging and balancing and tilting and trying to not get hurt in the competition. Fourth, a detente, uh, which allows for limited cooperation based on a grand deal, a grand compromise between the rising and the declining powers. Um, so for that, we need to adapt and reform the multilateral architecture to the balance of power of the 21st century. And we need to find a consensus between civilizations with different norms and values, what the rules of the world, what the organizing principles of the international order could be. And that would then allow us to cooperate on an interest basis uh, within the multilateral institutions which can be unblocked. So how could a hot war scenario look like? Um, to assess how likely a hot scenario is, we have to take a deeper look at the geopolitical competition uh, between the US and China and Indo-Pacific. It's important to understand that the very same situation looks very different from the perspective of Beijing and Washington. China feels encircled by the US alliance system, in particular the first and second island chains, which is essentially a line of military installations of the United States and its allies in the Western Pacific. Beijing fears that the US may cut off its supply lines as well as trade routes in the Strait of Malacca. So this chalk point, basically off the coast of Singapore, this is only 16 kilometers wide. China receives 70% of its oil and gas and ships 60% of its trade. It's therefore possible to understand China's geo strategy as an attempt to break out of this perceived encirclement westward through the Belt and Road Initiative, in particular the corridors in Pakistan and Myanmar, which allows Beijing to bypass the Strait of Malacca and access not only the Indian Ocean, but most importantly, its energy supplies in the Persian Gulf. And eastward through the South China Sea into the strategic death of the Pacific Ocean. And this militarization provokes clashes with the five ASEAN states, as well, obviously, with Taiwan. Looking at the same scenario from the perspective of Washington, China is the first aggressive military peer that pushes into the Pacific since Pearl Harbor, and therefore threatens Guam, Hawaii, and the American West Coast. So both for China and the United States, they see 
the question of Taiwan as a national security threat. This is why it's actually a shame that the strategic ambiguity that allowed to manage the tensions around uh, Taiwan for decades has been shattered by both sides. This makes it much harder to contain an escalation once clashes occur. These clashes can then lead to a direct confrontation between two nuclear armed superpowers and escalate into a regional and maybe even world war. This is why the hot war scenario can be categorized as high stakes but low probability. But this is why it's actually a step in the right direction uh, that Presidents Biden and Xi resumed direct military to military communication channels to avoid accidents and start a conversation about red lines to be understood and respected. So the most dangerous way that geopolitics could affect our lives is actually war. So let's hope cooler heads will prevail and a hot war can be avoided. That brings us to the Cold War scenario where we will see proxy wars, but the strategic competition between the great powers uh, will mainly play out on the fields of economy and technology. In the field of geoeconomics, we can see a couple of trends that are upsetting the world economy that we have seen over the last couple of decades. Number one, we see the politicization of market access. There is a rise of protectionism around the world and there is a threat that export markets can close or be dependent on political goodwill. You're my friend, you can come in. You're not my friend, you may go out. We also see the reorganization, the reconfiguration of global supply chains. There is a shift going on from efficiency or just in time towards resilience or just in case. Uh, and that already drives reshoring, nearshoring, onshoring. But now the geopolitical competition actually also will be considered on top of that and that will lead to friendshoring, basically investments and the movement of uh, production capabilities as well as supply lines to countries which seem to be like-minded. We did see an acceleration of digital automation already during COVID. Um, the replacement of the human risk factor with algorithms and uh, robots and artificial intelligence or machines is actually accelerating. And now geopolitical competition is accelerating this even more because it does allow to reshore supply lines and production facilities to the old industrial countries. And that will undercut the comparative advantage of cheap labor that was so important for developing countries to move up the global supply chain. We see de-dollarization, which is basically an attempt to replace the US dollar as the main uh, reserve currency in the world. Um, these attempts are mainly pushed forward by the BRICS countries. Taken together, all these trends could be considered a geopolitical tsunami that will hit every country in the world. Looking for the perspective of developing and emerging economies, this may pose a formidable threat. So if we look at the development model that was so successful over the last 40 years, uh, it's the flying geese model uh, that was basically uh, developed by Japan in the 1950s and 1960s. So this was based on cheap labor, export-led growth, and catch-up industrialization. Now the trends that I've been describing are threatening to make this model obsolete. Cheap labor, the comparative advantage is undermined by robots and algorithms. Export-led growth is only possible if your export markets remain open. And catch-up industrialization is only possible if tra technology transfer occurs and if you're part of the global supply lines. So all of that means there is risk and opportunity. There is the opportunity to benefit from geopolitical competition the so-called China plus one diversification, but there is also the risk of being cut out of the global supply lines. So this is where geoeconomics touches our lives. On the country level, some countries may no longer able to climb up the global value chain or may even be cut out of global supply chains and markets. But it also on the individual level, it undermines the ability of people to earn their livelihoods.
So the countries who are able to adapt their development models will be the winners of tomorrow and those who cannot will be left behind. Going back to the global level, geopolitical competition drives the contestation over the world order and it undermines the ability of multilateral institutions such as the United Nations to tackle the common challenges for all humankind from climate change to pandemics and peace. To understand how the world order of tomorrow could look like, we have to assess how the global balance of power of tomorrow may look like. If the US wins the strategic competition with China, the, the world may remain unipolar. That means the situation that we had after the triumph of the West in the Cold War um, will remain the same. The world is unipolar. Second, the world can become bipolar. The strategic competition between the US and China will be the defining feature of the next decades to come. And then we have enormous pressure on third powers, smaller and medium-sized powers to pick and choose sides. Third, we can see the emergence of a multipolar world, so that will actually see the rise of powers in the global south. Um, so there is a world emerging that looks very much like the world in Europe of the 19th century. Um, Russia, uh, India, the European Union and many others may actually form autonomous poles. And finally, I think what I find most likely is what you call asymmetric multipolarity. So the US and China basically remain a class of their own, but they're not dominant enough to divide the world into blocks like in the old Cold War. We do have continent-sized powers like Russia, like India, like the European Union, who have global ambitions, but are hampered by internal contradictions and weaknesses and therefore cannot form autonomous poles. And finally, we have regional powers from Brazil to Nigeria, South Africa, Turkey, Saudi Arabia, Iran, Indonesia, you name them, who follow multi-alignment strategies but are too weak to project their power globally. So how could the next world order look like? So if the US wins, the liberal world order survives. Uh, the unipolar moment survives and it will be a world that looks very similar to the 1990s. If China wins, we're gonna very likely look at an illiberal world order, maybe a part world order. How that could look like China has actually laid out in a couple of founding documents, the Global Development Initiative, the Global Security Initiative, the Global Civilization Initiative. Um, and it already had started to build the multilateral architecture it needs for this, uh, for this world order. We're looking at the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, the Asia Infrastructure and Investment Bank, the New Development Bank, or the former BRICS Bank, and maybe there could be an Asia Monetary Fund. So this world collaboration is still possible, but democracy and human rights will not be an emphasis. Finally, no one may win. The strategic competition could escalate into war and we have disorder. This is how the world looked like in the beginning of the 20th century where we saw two world wars, enormous uh, atrocities um, and internal upheavals. We can go to manage conflict through a great power concert. So this would be similar to Europe in the 19th century. Um, you could bring relative stability in this multipolar world through background deals, uh, basically respecting each other's spheres of interest and maybe cooperate in a very limited way informally through club governance such as the G20 as well as other minilaterals. I'm not sure if that's enough to actually tackle the global challenges we're all facing. And finally, there could be a detente, uh, which will lead to a hybrid multilateralism. So basically, there is a grand deal between the rising and the relatively declining powers to adapt the multilateral architecture, as well as a consensus over the organizing principles of the next world order. That could actually unblock the multilateral institutions, such as the United Nations, and allow us again to use them as platforms for collaboration to tackle global challenges. Luckily, there is a broad consensus between the global north and the global south that we need rules of the road 
and multilateral cooperation to ensure stability and prosperity. So there is actually convergence around the idea to safeguard the multilateral system by reforming and adapting it. But there are also some sites of disconnect. First, the multilateral order needs to reflect the balance of power of the 21st century, not of 1945. But adapting the institutions by giving greater voting rights, privileges, visibility, representation to the Global South will again face the resistance from the status quo powers. Second, there is a disconnect over the normative foundations of the world order. For the West, the rule-based international order is synonymous with the liberal order, which means democracy, rule of law, and universal human rights at its core. For much of the global south, democracy and human rights are domestic principles, not so much principles for organizing the international order. Here, many states adhere to so-called Westphalian principles, sovereignty, non-interference, and territorial integrity. The problem is the West can never give up universalism because that's the core of its identity and China can never accept universalism because it fears interference into its domestic affairs and it wants its own norms and values to be respected on the same level. This is why we're going to need a cross-civilizational dialogue over the organizing principles, the normative foundations of the world order. Maybe something along the lines of a renewed Helsinki Accord could emerge. In 1975, the Soviet Union accepted the universality of human rights and the West refrained from enforcing it. That was basically the basis for detente and uh, allowed peaceful coexistence in the last Cold War. Today, we need a similar understanding between China and the US as well as the Global South and the Global North. Most likely, the result will be a hybrid between liberal and Westphalian principles. And actually, such a hybrid already exists. It is the Carta of the United Nations.